Hi and welcome to this third part of this video series on how to build an Asteroids game in the Godot engine. So where we left off in the previous video, we had uh, just managed to get us to be able to shoot asteroids from our ship. We had made it so that both the ship and all the asteroids inherit from the same class that make it so we can wrap around the screen. We have enabled physics so we can collide with stuff. So if you remember the classical asteroids game, you know that there are three different sizes of asteroids. So whenever you hit an asteroid with a missile, the asteroids break it apart into multiple smaller pieces. And those can then be broken apart into even smaller pieces. So there are three different sizes, and it's only when you shoot the smallest size that they actually disappear. So the first thing we're going to do is modify the asteroid script a little bit, so that there are three different uh, possible sizes. So we're going to open that. So here you can see that the asteroid script is uh, simply a placeholder. So uh, let's add a few things. So first we're going to create an enum, and that's short for an enumeration, uh, something that keeps track of different states. So we can say enum, and we can call this size. And in here we can enter the different constants that this type can have. So for an example I can take small, medium, and large. And these are the three different types of asteroids. Next, we can declare a parameter, so that when we create an instance of the asteroid, we can control which size it has. So we say export, and then here we say size. Previously we always entered float here, but this will declare a enum parameter. And by default we can set it to large. So now, if we go under our asteroid here, you will see that we, in the top here, have a, a enum that can take different values. The next thing we need to add is that currently the sprite is always the same size, but of course we want the smaller asteroids to have a smaller sprite. And we can do that quite easily by just modifying the scale uh, on the actual sprite node, but we need to be able to keep track of it so we know how far away we want to spawn the new asteroids when it explodes. So I'm going to declare a variable here called the radius. And then on the red method here, I'm going to set the radius variable to a, a number that I compute from the sprites. So radius. So then I need to retrieve the width of the sprites so that we can compute the radius. So I take get node. And you remember that we always named the sprite sprite with a capital S. So the name of it is sprite. And then we can take the width of the texture. So we say texture dot get width. So since we want the radius, which is half of the width, we need to uh, take half of this value. But we still need to do one more thing. We need to scale it, since the sprite has been manually scaled in the GUI. So to do that, we take get node again. And this time we take scale. So now we have stored away the radius of the sprite in a local variable. So let's create the three different subscenes with different size. So I'm going to take this asteroid.tscm and I'm going to duplicate it and call this asteroid small. And I'm going to do the same thing again. Take this, duplicate, and call it asteroid medium, and then asteroid large. So now we have the three different sizes. We can go under the small, go under 2D. So we can take the sprite here and we can go down and change the scale to something like 0.1. So now we have a very small asteroid here, and we need to adjust the collider. So we take this, go down, and scale it down. And then lastly, we need to take the asteroid, and make sure that the size is small. So let's do the same thing for the medium one. And then the large. Like this. So it's important to make sure that it's the collider and the sprite that you're scaling and not the root node, the asteroid, because scaling the rigid body can introduce a lot of bugs when you work with physics. Next I'm going to adjust the mass of the different asteroids so that they actually collide a little bit different depending on how large they are. So I'm going to set the mass of the largest one to 2, the medium one to something like 1.5, and the smallest one can have a, a mass of 1. So let's try them out. We go back to the game scene. We can remove these two asteroids that we created before. And instead we can create a large one and then a medium one. We can move it over here. And then lastly a small one. Then let's take this. Give it a linear velocity of 200. That's okay. This one minus 200. 
and this one of 0 in the x direction and minus 200 in the y direction. So it seems to be working. So now that we have created different asteroids, uh, let's introduce the logic that makes them split into smaller pieces. So this requires us to communicate between different classes. So for an example, the missile is going to tell the asteroid that it's time to split. So to solve this, we're going to use something called signals. So a signal in Godot is when one class tells another class that it's time to do something, but you don't tell it how to do it. You just introduce the signal that this has happened. So if we go in under the asteroid class here, we will see that we already have a signal here, and it's called ready. So this is called whenever the uh, node is added to the scene, and it's one of the signals that are built in in Godot. So now we're going to create our own signal. So up here, I'm going to say signal explode. And this introduces a new signal called explode that this uh, class can receive. Next, we need to uh, declare the function that handles this kind of signal. So we go down here, and a common convention is to name all of the signal handlers by an underscore. So we say func explode. We can actually name this anything. It doesn't have to be named exactly the same thing as the signal, uh, but it's a good thing to do that uh, since it's easier to follow what is happening. So the last thing we need to do to finish off the signal is that we need to connect this declaration with this function. And we do that with the function that is called connect. So up here in the ready method, we say that when you're ready, connect the explode signal to this instance self and the function that is called explode. So whenever the explode event is received, we will call the explode method in ourselves. So when the explode event is called, we first want to delete ourselves, uh, since uh, we want new asteroids to take our place. And when you delete something in Godot Engine, uh, you don't use the keyword like delete or remove or clear or anything like that. In Godot, we free entities, because we free up resources. And since we don't want to free it immediately, we want to free it as soon as it's convenient, we queue the free. So the, key, the function that we use to delete entities is queue free. So to be able to spawn instances, first we need to load them, similar to how we did with the missile. So we're going to declare a var asteroid small equals preload and then the path to the asteroid. So now we have preloaded the asteroid small and let's do the same thing with the asteroid medium. So now we have both of these uh, loaded. We don't need to load the asteroid large since asteroids are always broken down into smaller pieces, so we only need the small and the medium. Next, let's go down to the explode method. And before we free ourselves, um, we want to make sure that we are not the smallest kind of asteroid. So if we are the smallest type of asteroid, we should simply disappear. So if size not equal to size small, then we need to uh, check which kind of asteroid it is that we want to instantiate. So we first declare the our asteroid that we want to spawn, but before we set it to anything, we want to do match size. And this allows us to call different kinds of logic depending on the size. And we can say medium. If we are of medium size, we should set the asteroid to asteroid small instance. And if we are of large size, we set it to the asteroid medium. So basically, we declare a variable called asteroid, and depending on the size of this asteroid, we instantiate different types, and then we add it. And just as before, we add it to our parent, not to ourselves, because we don't want the asteroid to uh, be a subchild of another asteroid. So normally, when you simply instantiate something like this and add it directly to the scene, um, it will show up at the position where it has in its own subscene. So if we take the asteroid here, for example, it is located around here, which means that it was always be instantiated on this position from the top left corner. And we don't want that. We want it to show up around the center of the previous asteroid. So we need to modify the script a little bit. And before we add it to the scene, we need to copy over our own position. So we say asteroid.position equals position. And this will copy over our position to the new instance. And next, if you know your physics, you know that we also need to copy over the velocity to make sure that the velocity is preserved. So we say asteroid.linear velocity equals our own linear velocity. So now we have uh, spawned an asteroid at our own position and with our own velocity. But we don't want to spawn simply one asteroid, we want to spawn multiple. 
So we're going to wrap this entire expression in a for loop. So we write for i in range, we want to start at zero, we want to operate to three. So this would give us zero, one, two, three different uh, increments. Then we can tab in this. Next, we don't want all of the asteroid to show up at the exact same spot. We want them to be slightly offset of our center. So to do that, we're going to create a offset dir. Var offset dir equals, and here comes a little bit of math. So uh, normally you might be used to computing angles in something called degrees. So 360 degrees is one entire rotation. But in math, you usually uh, use a little bit more precise unit called radians. So in radians, one entire rotation is two multiplied by pi. Half a rotation is pi. And this might seem a little bit weird, but there are many mathematical reasons why we do this. So whenever we uh, use rotations and angles and so on in, in Godot, we are actually using radians. So if we want to offset to be evenly spaced around the rotation, then we need to take 2 multiplied by pi, divide it by 3, so we get one third of the rotation, and then we need to multiply that by i to get the rotation of this iteration. So let's try it. We take pi multiplied by 2, which is one entire rotation. We divide it by three to get one evenly sized uh, piece. And then we multiply that with i to get the piece of this iteration. So now that we have this offset, let's add it to our position. So our position is the center of the asteroid. So to that, we want to add our radius. And you remember, we had this radius variable already, and that is a vector. So we can take the position plus radius and then we rotate the radius with our new offset there. And this will give us one position around our radius uh, that is evenly spaced with iteration. Next, we don't want to simply copy over the velocity directly, because that would make it move with the exact same speed as we were moving before. We want it to, you know, have a, an explosion, we want to, the pieces to fly out. So to control that, we add a parameter. So we go up here, and we say export float var explode force and by default we set it something like 300 then down here to the linear velocity we can add a new vector 2 with the x direction the right direction of the explode here zero as the y coordinates and then we rotate that with our new offset here so that would make the pieces spawn a little bit off center and then continue moving out so the last thing we need to do in the explode function here is that when we queue something we want it to stop interact with the physical system and that's just to prevent a object that is already going to explode to continue affecting other objects until it's cleared. So we're going to set sleeping to true. So before we can try this out, we need to actually invoke the signal somewhere. So when the missile hits the asteroid, we want the missile to emit an explode event. So we go under the missile. And here we need to find out when we hit something. And that is the physical operation, so we always do it in the integrate forces function. We can remove this, and we say func integrate forces states. And in here we can check for collisions. But by default, Godot doesn't store which collisions has happened. It simply invokes the integrate forces method and computes all the, the physical operations for you. Um, so to be able to retrieve the list of collision that has happened, we need to configure Godot uh, to actually store that information. So up here on the ready function, set max contacts reported. And this will tell Godot that I want you to report back to me which collisions has happened, and a maximum of one collision is, is enough. And then we want to iterate over the contacts that has happened. So first we need to uh, determine how many contacts happened, if it was zero or one. Uh, so we say var contacts equals state get contact count. Next we can iterate over this and say for i in range contacts. And then we need to retrieve the object that we collided with. So we take var contact equals state get contact collider and we don't want simply the collider, we want the object that we collided with. So we take collider object and then the iterator. So, now that we have the object we have collided with, we need to invoke the explode signal that we just created. But before invoking it, we probably need to make sure that it exists, because we might have collided with something that doesn't have that signal. 
So if contact, and then all of the signals are located on the script object. So we need to retrieve the scripts, get scripts, and then has script signal. So this will be true if the signal exists in that script attached to that object. So let's invoke it. We take contact dot emit signal. So now we have told it to explode. And then we should uh, free up ourselves since the missile shouldn't continue to exist after exploding. And to avoid uh, physics to continue interacting with the missile until it has been removed, we make it sleep. So let's try it. So the explodes are quite powerful, so we're going to tune down the force a little bit. So go under the asteroids, change the explode force to something a little bit lower, maybe something like 50. And remember to reload the values in the individual instances we already created. So I'm also going to reduce the mass of the asteroids a little bit, because right now the ship is bouncing around a lot. Now it feels better. So the last thing I'm going to do in this video is that um, when an asteroid moves out of the screen it's important that we remove it because currently we just create a lot of instances and throw it into the scene and we never clear anything except if it hits an asteroid. So that's quite simple to add. First we go into the missile scripts then up here we need to determine the size of the viewport and we can say unready bar viewport equals get viewport and then we take the visible rectangle. Next, we can introduce a process function that will be called each step. We say func process. And in here, we check if the missile is outside of the visible rectangle. So if not, viewport has point position. So if the, our position is outside of the viewport, we want to QA3. So that's all for this video. Uh, in the next video, we're going to add a few more gameplay elements by adding things like damage and health. And also, you will get score each time you hit an asteroid. So thank you for watching.